Now let's begin Part C of Chapter 4. When we look at the output and jump, the summary fit is on top here, where we have r squared of 90.48%. Then we have the root mean squared error underneath r squared adjusted. We have the mean response value and the number of samples. So we had 32 observations in this data. Then our analysis of variance contains the overall model test with the F ratio of 64.17 and a P value of 0 0.0001. So if I ask you to choose between this model and a previous model, if the root mean squared error was smaller in this one, so it's 121.343, that's less than the previous model of 143.598. Therefore, this is the better model because error is bad and smaller would be better. Also, we could test the individual coefficients here. So we look at the T ratios for each variable and their probabilities. So price has a T of negative 5.84 with a p-value less than 0001. It's definitely a good predictor. Notice we're setting alpha at 0 0.10 in this model. In that case, competition's p-value of 0 0.0743 is less than 0 0.10, so we'll reject HO, and it's a good predictor. The same is true for style and for comfort rating. When we go to predict with the model, we'll be taking our regression equation, which can be found under the prediction expression, and plugging in values for the x's. So we'll start with our y-intercept, 2,786.52, minus 2.7369, times some value for price minus 58.1689 times the value for number of competing boot stores, plus 54.0169 times a style rating. And then we'll either put in 1 times 46.99 if the boots were labeled comfortable, or 0 times negative 46.99, which would cancel out if they're receiving a non-comfortable score. Now we can actually see the results of predicting with a thing called the profiler. Notice that at the bottom of the profiler, you have each of your X variables labeled and a red value above it. You can click on those and type in new values and change the outcomes on the left side for the Y variable. The number on top for the Y variable for sales is your predicted value. That's a point estimate. And then the bracketed values would be your 95% confidence interval on the mean of Y. So if I plug in $200 for the price of the boots, the fact that we have three competing boot stores, that they got an overall style rating of 15, and they were labeled one for comfortable. We would predict the sales to be $2,921.88. Then we're 95% confident the mean sales would be between $2,802 and $3,041. Now we'll discuss second order models. We use quadratic terms in models that have curves. So back in chapter three, when we looked at a, a, one of the example problems, we saw a curve in our residuals and a little bit in the actual scatter plot. So if I took X and squared it, that squared X is called a second order or higher order term. 
We can also try interacting x's if we think that together they would yield different values of y. So to interact them, we multiply two x variables together. And a good way to understand what interaction is, on the back of a box of brownies, if you go to bake them, it says if you're using a metal pan, bake it at 350 for 30 minutes. But if you're using a glass pan, bake it at 325 for 35 minutes. The pan type and the temperature interact to yield different minutes that we need to bake it in order to have the same moistness outcome for the brownies. So that's what interaction is. At the bottom, you see it looks a little daunting when you look at this equation in terms of just y's and x's, but it's saying y, the thing I want to predict, is equal to beta sub naught, the y-intercept plus beta sub 1 times x sub 1. So if x is the temperature, that would be your first variable. And then if x2 is the time, that would be your second variable. And then if they interact, you would take time and temperature together. So that's all that reads as. So don't be intimidated by the equation when you see all the betas. That's just for, a, there's a beta for each variable in your equation. So a complete second order model would have all of your first order terms, x1 and x2. Then it would have both of those squared. So x1 squared, x2 squared. Then it would also have your interaction of x1 times x2. All together, this is a complete second order model. Sometimes we start with this if there are only two or three variables, and then we reduce it down to just the good predictors that stay in the model. We don't interpret those higher order terms. They're not linearly related. We also wouldn't interpret a dummy variable, such as comfort level. So multiple regression is known as one of the most abused tools in statistics. The two main reasons, it's easy to find programs that will work out the regression equation. Excel's data analysis will do it. But the problem is that we have people with limited statistical knowledge. Most universities just have students take one course in statistics for a business degree. So that limits their knowledge of how to actually read the output. Another problem that can occur is an artificially inflated R-squared. That happens when you have too many predictor variables and not enough samples. What happens every time you enter in a new predictor, your R-squared value will increase. So to check for this, we take r squared minus the adjusted r squared. If that value that results is around 10% or higher, then it's artificially inflated and we need more samples or we need to pull out some of the predictors. Extrapolating data is still bad. An example would be in 1960, Models were built to predict the gross national product using values between 6% and 8% for inflation. But in the 70s, we had runaway inflation, and we started using numbers that were in double digits, so the predictions were far off. These are some of the problems we've talked about in multiple regression. First, multicollinearity meant we had x's that were correlated. Our solution was to run stepwise, and if the boxes had checks, they were good predictors. If there's no check, there was probably some problem with that variable. Heteroscedasticity happens 
if we have varying variation or non-constant variation in our residual plots. We're going to take the log of y to try to solve that and rerun the equation. Severe outliers should be removed. Artificially inflated R-squared is going to need more samples or fewer predictors. Misspecified models happen when we see a curve in the residual plot. If that happens, we want to include an X-squared value or transform our data. And finally, we want to avoid extrapolating data and only use predictors in the given range of the X values. Now I would like you to work through the textbook examples and problems. And that will get us through chapter four.